In the spiritual community, we hear about witches familiars, spirit animals, power animals, animal totems, and animal spirit guides. But which ones are which? Witchcraft, Wicca, and Native American spirituality, just to name a few, each have different types of animal spirit guides and different meanings. Here are the definitions as I've come to understand them and how to find your animal spirit guides. The term familiar originated in the Middle Ages. To sum this up, I'm going to share with you a quote from witchcraftandwitches.com. In medieval times, during the witch hunts and the Inquisition period, a familiar spirit was defined as an animal-shaped spirit believed to do the evil bidding of a witch. These animals were thought of either as an extension of the spirit of the witch herself, or an animal possessed with the spirit of a demon. They were often believed to have supernatural powers, such as the ability to change shape. At that time, people accused of witchcraft were often the outcasts of society, living in nature and seeking companionship with animals. At one point during the witch hysteria of early modern Europe, the mere possession of a black cat or an unusual pet was considered sufficient cause for investigation as a witch. The witch's teat was considered a fail-safe method of identifying a witch at the height of the witch craze. It was actually a blemish or skin tag, which witch hunters associated with the feeding of animal familiars with blood rather than milk. Because of these absurd medieval myths, some modern witches today will totally reject the use of the term familiar altogether. Tucklin Penry here on YouTube, for example, states that she would not personally entertain the idea of quote-unquote familiars because it pays respect to the witch hunters who tortured their victims to admit to things that were likely totally untrue. In her video on the subject, she brings up the concept that the witch hunts were majorly a means of suppressing and controlling women, and by labeling skin tags as evidence of witchcraft, most older women were able to be targeted. Rather than labeling a particular pet as a familiar, she suggests that nature-based spirituality leads to a close affiliation with the animal kingdom as a whole. Nowadays, we often hear the term familiar applied to the favorite pet of a magical practitioner. Generally, we think of a familiar as an animal that we have a deep spiritual connection with, who often guides us to help us make important life decisions or even aids in spell work. While almost no one today would suggest that the obscene ideas mentioned in the medieval perspective are true, there's still fairly heated debate on the subject. Now, the argument is more about what makes a familiar a familiar. For example, a lot of people new to paganism are eager to have that stereotypical black cat and hurriedly proclaim their pet to be their familiar, or go out and adopt one with that intention. On the other hand, you have those who will argue that the relationship between a witch and familiar goes much deeper than that and has to hold up to a list of pretty strict criteria in order to be considered valid. I agree that not every witch needs to have a familiar and that not every pet is your familiar. I, however, have a slightly different opinion on what makes a familiar a familiar. One thing that seems to set my opinion apart from many other popular opinions in the modern witchcraft culture is that I don't believe a familiar has to specifically aid a witch in spell work, so to say. Of course, I perform rituals when I feel called to, but what makes me a witch every day of my life is my way of seeing the spiritual significance in every part of my daily experience, and consciously choosing to create ritual around my otherwise mundane tasks, inserting intention into everything that I do. My main objective as a witch are to learn to live in harmony with the flow of the universe, while also realizing my own power to affect the direction of my life, while hopefully having a positive impact on everything I come into contact with. I see my familiars as being members of the animal kingdom who have presented themselves with a clear intention to aid me in understanding my place in the grand scheme of existence. Do all animals do that in a way? If you have an eye for it, yes, absolutely they do. So, what exactly distinguishes any animal from a familiar, in my opinion? Well, I feel that there are different categories of familiars, and I'll break them down here from the broadest perspective to the closest to home. 
In the neo-shamanic tradition, modern practitioners seek to re-evoke the ancient tribal wisdom known as animism. I like to describe animism as kind of like what Disney's Pocahontas means when she says, I know every rock and tree and creature has a life, has a spirit, has a name. In this worldview, every single thing we come into contact with is directly related to us in some way. The way we interact with nature, how we affect our surroundings, and the way that nature responds to us are intrinsically linked. In the collective consciousness, we all have subconscious memories of what it was like to take the form of different animals and plants, and we're physically linked to everything in nature, whether we consciously realize it or not. An animal spirit guide is any species in nature that presents itself to you at a time when you can really take notice of it and implement its characteristics into your life to resolve a problem or to evolve into the next version of yourself. Oftentimes we can be so caught up in the very human habit of overthinking that we can completely overlook the simplest universal truths. An animal spirit guide will enter your life in some random way, grabbing your attention and pulling you out of your usual autopilot way of thinking. This is usually not an individual animal that you know personally or generally spend a lot of time in direct communication with. It's usually a wild animal that crosses your path unexpectedly or in a very noticeable incident. Other times it can show itself in more subtle ways, but in a very repetitive, persistent manner that causes you to think twice about your place in nature. It can be a beautiful reminder of how you can be more like this animal in your current situation, or it can be a shadow totem, an unpleasant experience with a creature that challenges your ego identity. To use myself as an example, I absolutely love crows, even though they scare some people. I find them to be beautiful, and they help me to connect with the autumn and the death part of the life-death rebirth cycle. On the other hand, I have had a completely horrible animal spirit guide experience with fleas several years ago. Several years ago, when I first started my business, I was so absorbed in trying to get it all figured out that I was kind of not paying a lot of attention to my cats. I had four cats at the time, and they were living an indoor-outdoor lifestyle when they could come and go through the cat flap as they pleased, and they were outside mixing with some pretty sketchy characters. It ended up leading to a horrible flea infestation in my house that forced me to slow down and actually pay attention to the small details both in my home and in the greater scheme of my life. And most importantly, it showed me the importance of not being a workaholic and actually having a work-life balance. Long story short, I was reminded not to sweep things under the rug, literally, but to notice the small details and listen when the universe is trying to tell me that I'm procrastinating about something, otherwise my ego will get knocked down a peg or two. Overall, the idea is that animal spirit guides are the universe's way of giving you a sign when you're lacking direction or drifting off course from the path of your highest good. They usually only show up for a short time with the purpose of reminding you to learn from observing nature. Either they'll show up in person, or images or references to the species may show up over and over again in the media you're consuming, or in conversations you hear in passing. This has happened to me many times. A few years ago, it was with dolphins, where I was just seeing dolphins absolutely everywhere and in the weirdest and most random places. This has also happened to me with elephants. Goes to um, protecting like elephants in the wild, goes to all the charity. and even some animals that I was unaware of as a species until I started noticing them and learning about them. Um, so the cats were just freaking out because something was making a weird noise. I thought it was a cicada, but as it would happen, it's a fairy or something. Like literally look at him, like his wings are literally leaves. Like, come on, dude. That's some supernatural bug stuff going on. Uh, happy autumn equinox from a weird fairy bug in my house. 
Well, there's only one thing for it, guys. We're gonna have to consult Arthur Spiderwick's field guide because only Arthur knows what's going on here. Here's a really funny video clip from my Instagram stories a few years ago where I found what I'm guessing is some kind of a cricket or a grasshopper that was absolutely huge. So I decided to play along and pretend that I thought he was a fairy before catching him in a jar and setting him free outside. There we go, guys. We found him. He is a stray sod. And boy, is he stray in this house where there are cat monsters trying to eat him. Good luck to the guy. Seriously, though, guys, tell me that's not him. They can easily be taken for granted if we're not open to them, but when we agree to let them teach us, it can make all the difference in our lives. Again, though, don't overthink it. While you can always learn from every creature you encounter, not everyone is trying to teach you some profound, life-altering lesson. When they do, you'll know. Keeping with the same idea of universal consciousness and animism, we come to a sort of animal spirit guide that doesn't just present itself occasionally, but is deeply connected to you throughout the duration of your life. It's said that everyone has at least one spirit animal, and many of us have a few different ones. Your personality traits mirror the characteristics of that animal, and paying attention to that species can have a long-term benefit along your journey. I, for example, definitely resonate with cats, crows, and owls, just to name a few. For a professional explanation of what animal spirit guides and animal totems are, and how to tell the two apart, I've gotten a lot of my favorite information from Jordana Van's YouTube channel, which I will link here. Finally, we arrive at the type of animal familiar that lives right in our home as a member of our immediate family. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of debate in the modern pegging community as to what exactly sets a familiar apart from an average pet. Three things seem to ring true for almost everyone. First of all, a familiar can be any type of pet, not just a black cat. Secondly, not every witch has to have a familiar or will ever need one. And thirdly, not every pet has the potential to be your familiar in the widely accepted definition of the term. You have to really use your intuition to decide if you have a familiar or just a beloved furry family member. While I do not agree with the extremely rigid criteria that some witches hold familiars up to, but I do tend to hold a similar belief that a familiar sets itself apart from other pets in your life by connecting to you in a very direct spiritual level of communication. In a witch and familiar relationship, neither is really the pet or the owner. It's more of a mutual sense of responsibility that spans across almost every area of our lives together. It's a symbiotic relationship in which you help to improve each other's life experience in ways the other wouldn't have otherwise been capable of. You look out for each other, guiding, teaching, and protecting one another. Some believe that the relationship between a person and their familiar is a pre-birth karmic contract where both parties have agreed to help one another's souls to evolve in this incarnation. It's a bond that's almost impossible to describe objectively, and I'm certain that every witch and their familiar have a totally unique story that cannot be put into a box. It's a duo that together creates something far greater than the sum of the parts. A broad example of the way I distinguish between a pet and a familiar would be just like not all of your best friends are necessarily your coven members, not all of your pets are necessarily your familiars. I can best illustrate this concept by telling you more about my relationship with my cats. And while we're here, why are cats so often considered witches familiars? Since I know not everyone who watches this video is going to be a cat person, I've decided to create a part two about all things witches and cats. We're also accustomed to assuming that witches and black cats go together like peanut butter and jelly, but why though? 
Well, here is an in-depth exploration of all things witches' cats, from medieval cultural stereotype that is mimicked in Halloween decor to the spiritual role cats play in the life of the modern practical witch. <laughs> 